can see Water's raging at my feet I can feel The breath of those surrounding me I can hear The sound of nations rising up We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome I can walk down this dark and painful road I can face every fear of the unknown I can hear all God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome The same power that rose Jesus from the grave The same power that Commands that to wait lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands death to wait, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Greater is he that is living in me. He's conquered. Praise Jesus for his goodness. Today I want to talk about something that is basically elementary to Christianity, or it's one of the fundamentals of, Christian, of Christianity, is forgiveness. We are here because we are forgiven. All of us are here for one reason. We've experienced, if, if I'm sure most of us, I don't know about the young people, but they're headed down that road if the parents teach them right, is we are here because we are forgiven. We've been forgiven a debt. And the debt that would have had to be paid was too big for any of us to even pay for. So Jesus took on that privilege, if you want to call it that. He took on that and he paid the debt. And now we have free access to the throne of grace, to the Father. But with that forgiveness comes something with us. And this is where my message will start, is you know, we all need to look in the mirror and see if we have any unforgiveness towards somebody else. Because there's a condition to you not forgiving somebody. And there's two conditions, I would say. The Bible says, if you don't forgive somebody, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you. But if you forgive, somebody, uh, if you have been forgiven, for me it's very easy to forgive somebody because I have, I know I've been forgiven of a lot of things. And this, my forgiveness came 2,000 years ago before I even committed, and all, likewise all of you. You haven't even committed the things you committed, and yet <clears throat> you're forgiven. Isn't that grace and mercy in a nutshell? 
Uh, but before I get in, we get into this message, I want, I want the Lord's blessing and his understanding in this so that we are, did look in the mirror and we all see clearly on what our work is in as, far as, as, as far as going on in Christian life, this is essential to your Christianity. If you do not do, do this fundamental or this uh, elementary thing, you will have problems everywhere else. So, having said this, let's rise and ask the Lord for his blessings. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come here. Lord, I ask you to come here. No, Lord, Holy Spirit, you're here in the Lord in Jesus' stead. So I ask you to fill this room in every heart. You'll convict the heart that needs to forgive. And it's only easy because it's a mental thing once we come overcome it mentally it becomes easy so you will help us understand that that is not only what we have to do it's necessary that we forgive people who have hurt us and heart regardless how they've hurt us lord jesus you will open our hearts to that understanding and help us to free ourselves that is up to us you will do the freeing but once we open our our, our uh understanding to that and you guide us through that door we can now be free from all areas of our life where satan cannot hold anything over our heads in jesus name i pray that you will set us free in every area of our life thank you lord jesus you may be seated <clears throat> the debt forgiving a debt uh, i look at the act of forgiveness much the same way as forgiving a debt now, now think about this for a, bit, for a moment. Someone who has done you wrong, now that person owes you a debt. Follow, follow me with this. this. It gets a little bit tangled up if you don't follow. Someone ha that has done you wrong in the past, I don't care when it was, before you were a Christian, after, if they've done you wrong, now that person owes you a debt. You are now holding something over somebody. They owe you making it right however they wronged you. This is what they owe you. <clears throat> now let's dig a little deeper. When you owe a bank a debt, like a mortgage, car, car loan, whatever, etc., whatever, whatever the loan is, who really has the power in that relationship? Who holds the authority in that relationship? It's the bank, right? You're the one who owes the debt. They're the one that needs to forgive the debt. But obviously, you know, the bank is not going to do that. But in our case, let's continue this here. See what I have written down here. But if you look at it that way, isn't it also possible to see how you could wield power over the person that harmed you by not forgiving them? Particularly in circumstances where the person is sorry, and I might add genuinely sorry, and, and I might add even, even if they're not, that's not the problem. Whether they're sorry or not sorry is not the, the reason for forgiving. The reason for forgiving is for your own freedom, not for theirs. They might not even know that they did anything to you, but you know in, a, in your heart when a person has wronged you that the only way to get healing is to forgive. After all, do not forget that's what Jesus did. He had no not, nothing to do in this matter. He just decided to take that bank debt or whatever the debt was and he paid it in full for, the re for eternity, never to be remembered anymore. If you remember a debt that you have done, you have not experienced the love of Christ. I know Satan can come in and remind you of some past stuff. Even there, you tell him. That's why it's important to know the Word of God. The Bible says, your sins have been taken to the depths of the sea, never to be remembered no more. So whatever thing you have committed or will commit, it is, as far as God is concerned, it is not in account. It is not there. It's blotted out by the blood of Christ. And again, remember, when you committed, when you, uh, before you even committed one sin, this price, this debt was paid. Before you even made that loan at the bank, it was forgiven. Yet you will never have to pay nothing of, the, of whatever you did or borrowed. And this is just what I'm comparing it to when it comes to the, to, the, to the sins that we have committed. Going to Scripture now. No, I still have a little bit here. Uh, this is, uh, and again, this is not easy stuff when it comes to forgiving something that some, somebody did you wrong, deliberately. Uh, that they harmed you, whether it's verbally abused you, sexually abused you, however they abused you, they, they molested you. 
whether it's physically, verbally, verbally or sexually, or emotionally, it doesn't matter. To free yourself, make the choice, and forgive. And again, I'm not saying this, this thinking it's an easy task. The easy, hardest task is doing it. The easy part comes after. Like when uh, Elizabeth, when Tora uh, uh, Corrie Ten Boom did it to a, to a soldier that was uh, in the concentration camp, uh, I think it was Ravensbrück, where she was uh, in, uh, under, uh, in ca captive by the Nazis, and he saw her sister being mistreated herself, walking around naked day after day for I don't know how many years. And then after the war was over, she was in, in giving a message in church, and in the back she sees a gentleman come forward not dressed with a Nazi uniform, but the second she had a backflash or flashbacks where she saw all of a sudden she saw the, the Nazi insignia, so everything, she saw the hat they wore, and all of a sudden she got angry. She got angry at the man. And he was coming up and asking and uh, telling her what good message she had and stretched out his hand. She couldn't take his hand. And the Holy Spirit said, shake, her, shake his hand, but all that was in her was anger. How can, I, how can you put me in that position? I don't even want to shake this hand. So all the memories came to her, and she was so angry. And then she said, I know what I have to do is I have to shake his hand. So she sec st said the second she stuck out her hand and started shaking his hand, something, electricity, went through, and something changed. It said it was the greatest power of the love of Jesus Christ for a person who hurt her so bad of display of it that she has ever experienced. She says he could not even explain it. That's how powerful it was. But it was within her power to stretch out her hand and to give him his hands. And that's all she said. But she had to forgive him. And her forgiveness, or asking for forgiveness, was a simple outstretch of her hand. And then the rest the Holy Spirit took over. Uh, in Ephesians 4, I go to Scripture now. 4, verse 31 and 32, okay, out of the King James Version, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted. There it goes, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This seems to be small, and you don't even seem to pay attention to it, but as God in Christ forgave you is... is as you all know how much he gave, forgave you, what you have done, and how he has forgiven you, not to be remembered anymore. That is within your, your, your own mind, and you know that. Don't you want to extend that forgiveness? Somebody has hurt you to someone, someone else. In Mark 11, verse 26, and whenever you stand praying, what does it say there? It says, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. In uh, Matthew 6, 15, probably in the same sermon, just come from Matthew's point of view, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespass. In Matthew 18, 21 to 22, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will, I, my, will, I, will my brother sin against me and, and I forgive him? In other words, if he's, how often am I supposed to forgive him? And Jesus said, as many as seven times. Questions, Jesus said, no, Peter asking, as many as seven times. And Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. That's basically a, a hyperbole, like a, 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 as often as you want. There is no end. Forgive. It's, it's, there's no number there. He just threw a number there, but you forgive is, is the answer, regardless of how many times. In Luke 6, uh, 6 verse 37 it says judge not and you will not be judged condemn not and you will not be condemned forgive and it will be forgiven this is Jesus speaking he has a lot to say about forgiving in the apostle Paul writing to the Colossians in chapter 3 verse 13 he says bearing with one another and if any has a complaint against another forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also must you forgive. 
Do we get the gist of the message already? It is about you forgiving anything that has ever been done to you. And again, I am not by any means saying it's an easy task because some people have been hurt immensely. But the hurt, the healing to that hurt is in your power to overcome by forgiving of what the person has done to you. In Matthew 5, verse 23 to 24, it says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, in other words, if you have something to bring before the Lord, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave it, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister or whoever. This means whoever. And then come and offer your gift. So why, why I said it is, it is elementary or, or fundamental to Christianity is because it is for you to live a victorious Christian life and to go on, this has to be taken care of. If there is any bitterness towards anybody else, then make that right before God. I remember growing up, and this is my own account of having to forgive. I loved to play hockey. I loved it. With, it, it was passionate. It was like my God. And where we grew up, we weren't allowed to have, play hockey and even have skates. And my dream was to obviously make the NHL, as ignorant as I was, but that doesn't stop you from dreaming. I'd say it like somebody else. Uh, somebody, somebody made a, a, a comment uh, that his dream was to play in the NHL. And then one, when the question was asked, well, why didn't you play in the NHL? He says, well, I never got around to buying skates. Well, for me, it was a bit different. My skates got burnt all the time by our German teacher, so he would make sure my NHL dream was destroyed by burning our skates. And in my mind, I was an, I was an unbeliever. I was a young 13-year-old kid, not understanding why I could go to this colony and play hockey there, but at home, my skates got burned. So I asked the question, and I was simply told to just shut up and do as you're told. But that, that doesn't satisfy. That's not an answer for an inquisitor, for somebody who is questioning. So I asked, uh, why can't I play hockey? Why can't I have skates? What's, why did, can this colony and why can't I? And what happened within me was bitterness and anger grew towards the person that pursued us in make sure we did not play hockey with skates. We could play hockey, but not with skates. They were like straight out of hell. So I would sit in church, and I would dream of how I could kill this person. And I'm not going to mention names, no colonies. I don't want to go there. That's just my own experience, and I'm recount recounting and recalling of how hatred filled my heart and anger. And this carried into my Christian life. I remember sitting, going to visit after I was... Uh, gone from the colony, and I actually went to visit this person. And I said, within, I said to within myself, I'm not, I, I'm not, I can't see that person. I can't stand the guy. And the Holy Spirit rebuked me and, he, and said, forgive him. And right then and there, I said, Lord Jesus, I choose to forgive him. I had almost the same experience that Corey Ten Boom had. I went to meet him, and as if nothing has ever happen, had ever happened between us. That's how awesome and powerful forgiving somebody is, how freeing it is. If you want to be free, I don't care what they've done to you. I know there are degrees of how people can hurt you, especially when it, uh, when it comes to sexual things, how women have gotten hurt. The, the healing to that comes from you. You need to say, Lord, I know what they did to... Even by sh if, if, you, if, you, if you don't have the... the strength. Seek out somebody who can trust and pray and then lead you in that direction. But ultimately, you're the one that has to do it, and you can do it by just listening to what I'm saying here and just do it, whatever you have to. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I have no idea whether it's somebody on YouTube or somebody here, but the, the message is forgive. And in, uh, my, in closing, I have a final scripture here out of Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 to 10. And it says this, out of King James Version, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. You really need to study and think about this. Instead of bringing those sins into the open, you show charity. 
in forgiveness. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received this gift, even so minister the same one to another. As we have received that from Christ, we receive the same to others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And again, I want to put something on record. That does not mean you have to trust the person ever you have forgiven. That is, for complete healing, I think it should be that way, but that doesn't mean it has to go. Forgiveness has to do with freeing yourself. That doesn't mean you have to fellowship with the person even if, uh, if, if he becomes a Christian. It doesn't mean that. Forgiveness is for your inner healing. Or you have to become best friends with him again. That is a totally different matter. Sometimes trust, if trust is betrayed, it can never be fixed again. And it doesn't really have to because there's only one person we can really trust anyway. It's, it's the one friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that's Jesus Christ. Don't put that kind of pressure on another human being that you would put lay uh, you would lay your life uh, on the line for them, even though Scripture does say that we, sh uh, we should lay our lives down for, for the brethren. And that, my friends, is my message to you that you f if there is any unforgiveness in your heart, quickly make it right. And the Lord will give you victory in that, and you will find out how gracious and how good God is in experiencing His forgiveness all over again, even though it's been set and done. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You love Jesus this morning. He is the answer to all, all your problems. There's nothing in this world that will take him by surprise. He loves you. This morning I want to speak of one name, and there's only one name that stands forever. How we obtain that name and that power, it's in the written Word of God. And i sorry I didn't have the verses to put up. I was a little bit confused if I'm preaching this morning or not, but it's my mistake. The Lord Jesus is awesome. He's powerful. But where did He get that power from? Why is He so powerful? When we go into the Word of God, into Psalms 138.2, where He says, he magnified his name above. He magnified his word above his name. That's God speaking. Now we have to remember what, cause he, what is he talking about when it comes to the word. Who is the word? What is the word? In the beginning was the word. The word was God. And the word was with God. So keep in mind, that's talking about Jesus. He always was, he always will be, the Word always was, and that's why Jesus came into this world, became flesh. Now, the Word became flesh. In other words, the Word became you and me. That's what he took on. And there's a reason for that. It's the only way he can save mankind from their sins as became one of us. And the only way he can save you and me is become one of you and me, even though he was God, but still he was flesh and man, the man of God. He was Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but he was still a human. He was in a human being. If you're looking at a human being, you're looking on Jesus, that's the way he was. Only he was God. So when we go into the Word of God and say, why would Jesus have that name? You can go out and rebuke a devil in the name of God. There's no power there. There's nothing. What kind of power do we actually possess when we accept Jesus? What kind of, of victory do we have when we turn to Jesus for salvation? No government no politician can give you that power, even though they claim they have power over you. But as a Christian, they do not. The power that we have is beyond government. The power that we possess is stronger than any government because we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit backing us up, living inside of us. There is, there is nothing else. And if we, as, as people, depend 
And I'm going to have to bring it down. That's what the Lord laid on my heart. If we are trying and starting to, to, to realize and to, to re, and, and to point ourselves and to, how oh, I can get the word, to, to depend on government, we are in trouble as a church because the church belongs to Jesus, not to the government. The government cannot tell you what to do. They cannot say what you have to preach. Our order is we are here instead of Jesus to proclaim the Word of God to set people free. That's what we have inside of us. That's why God the Father gave him a name. Let's turn, if you have a Bible, sorry, Brendan, if you can find it, to, to Philippians chapter 2. I will go to verse... I go to verse... Um, what is it here? 2, 9, 10, and 11. It's very simple and to the point. When God the Father speaks, He says in the Word of God, Wherefore, God also had highly exalted Him and had given Him a name which is above every name. So if you're trying to cast out a devil or a demon in the name of God, it will not work. The minute you may name the name of Jesus in any which way or form, you are racist. You, you, are, you are offensive because devils don't like that name. It's a powerful name. That name destroyed every devil and demon and sickness in hell. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. I don't care if anybody stands up and says, I am greater than God, and God has retaliated on people that have done that. You do not fall around with the Word of God. You do not go against the Word of God. When Jesus says, I am God, he means it because he can back it up. And that's why he lives with inside of you and me. We have that same power, just like the song said, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power lives in you and in me. We have to realize it. We have to release it. Don't let the devil drag you down. Don't let the government drag you down that you can't do that. No. We are under the authority of the Word of God. We are under the authority of Jesus. And there is no other name. Devils Demons, hell trembles at the name of Jesus. Don't ever forget it. You are equipped. That's why Jesus said, Therefore, all of heaven and all of power in heaven on earth is given unto me. Therefore, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, casting out devils, healing the sick, all sorts. That's the power we have within us. We have no excuse, ladies and gentlemen. We are here in the gap. We are the salt of this earth, earth, and we are being idon. The devil hates you and me with a passion. That's why governments now are trying to outlaw Christianity. That's why all the world is against Christianity. You know why? Their agenda cannot go forth until it can silence the child of God. And that will not work until Jesus takes you and me out of here. So always remember... Jesus loves you. Jesus equipped you. No matter what you're doing this morning, no matter if you're listening by YouTube or Internet, Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants to save you because there is great things waiting for those that love Jesus. So the Lord Jesus bless you. The Lord Jesus keep you. And thank you for listening. And the Lord bless you. My fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, your word has said, is ever only Jesus. You died, you live, you reign, you plead. There's love in all your words and deeds. This weary heart finds all it needs. In ever only Jesus, I want to know you, Jesus my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I 
concentrate my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know you more. Though some should curse me for your name, I have no fear, I have no shame. You stand with me for all my days, my ever only Jesus. I want to know you, Jesus my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul. I trade my treasure. All my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know you more. Like wave after wave on the ocean, like all of the sand on the shore, your beauty and glory are endless. Oh, Jesus, I know you more like wave after wave on the ocean like all of the sand on the shore your beauty and glory are endless oh Jesus I must know you more I want to know you Jesus my Lord my soul I trade my treasures and all my rewards Jesus to know you then know you more I want to know you Jesus my Lord King of the trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know you more, Jesus, to know